All right, so we're gonna get started. We're, this is session two, finally. And we're essentially looking at the uh, second section in the Hugging Face uh, official course. And so uh, this week we'll be looking at, so last week we looked at their high level pipeline API, which is a really friendly, you know, two or three lines of code to be able to use some of the core NLP task with, with raw text. And so we're going to be looking at this week how to actually do these things ourselves. So working with tokenizers, working with models, and then working with the outputs uh, directly. And then we'll also take a look at Blur. And so, as I mentioned, there's at least three fast AI, AI hugging face uh, integration libraries. So Blur's one of them, that's the one I created. Um, and we'll look at how it handles tokenization and models in a fast AI world. Um, and then next week, we're gonna be looking at all three frameworks and we're gonna have folks um, presenting a demo using the same data set and task. So you can get an idea and feel for some of the design decisions as well as how they work. And, and you can choose um, one or more to use in your own work. So resources again, uh, the study group registration page is up there. Hopefully we'll be back online next week without any disruptions. Uh, until then, we have the study group Discord and it, uh, also the uh, presentation and the collab notebooks we'll be looking at will be shared at the end of this. So we'll share them on the, the Discord and, and probably also through uh, weights and biases. Again, if you're new to Fast AI, check out the course, check out Zach's Walk with Fast AI course as well. Um, there's Fastbook, which is great. There's a reading group going on that um, Amon's doing from Weights and Biases. It's worth checking out. And uh, in terms of the Hugging Face libraries, they integrate with FastAI. I have those listed here. And then, of course, we've got to mention the Chai Time Data Science podcast. The only thing that could be better about it is if it was renamed to the Dark Coffee Roast Time Data Science podcast. But I'll let Sonia think about that over the next week. And then there's weights and biases for experiment tracking and, and those type of things. So these are the resources and we'll get right into it. So uh, essentially when we look at what's going on in the pipeline API, there's really three things that are happening is one, it's tokenizing your raw text. And again, last week we talked about that for anything to go through a model, we have to create a numerical representation of it. And so that's what the tokenizer does. And, and uh, essentially the task of the tokenizer is to split words into subwords or symbol, symbols called tokens. And there's various tokenization strategies with each with their pros and cons. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But at the end of the day, each of these tokens is mapped to an integer. And that integer is used to index into a dictionary or a list essentially um, for each token hat for, for each, uh, token. And that's how we actually, those are the numbers that we actually pipe in through our model. And when the tokenizer runs, as you've seen last week, and we'll see today is that it actually creates not just identifiers, the IDs for each token, but it also creates, um, other tensors. So we've seen like the concept of an attention mask or for some models, uh, like BERT, it will create a token type IDs uh, tensor as well. And because remember BERT was trained on a next sentence prediction task. So there's a first sentence and second sentence. So it uses these token type IDs to differentiate uh, the two. And then the big thing to remember is that when you're using transformers is that all this pre-processing needs to be done in exactly the same way as when the model was pre-trained. And that essentially means that when you're um, going to train a transformer based on a checkpoint, you wanna get a tokenizer from the same checkpoint. So the indices are the same. And also remember that one of the first things these transformer models do is actually those indices are turned into an embedding. So a high dimensional vector to represent each token. And that's something that's learned. And so if you wanna take advantage of the pre-trained checkpoint as a model, you're gonna to wanna to use the same tokenizer they use to pre-train it, or essentially you're starting from scratch. 
So just keep that in mind. Like most people, at least for myself, I've never trained a tokenizer custom. I've always just used whatever the checkpoint um, provides. So the second part of the pipeline is once you have your, um, your raw text tokenized, so converted to numbers, as well as some of the other things like the attention mask and uh, token type IDs, is we actually run those inputs through a model. And this base kind of auto model, we talked about those, like there's auto model, there's auto model for various tasks. The base auto mo model simply is going to output a feature vector for each of those tokens that goes through uh, the model. And so um, that's also known as the hidden states. Um, we also refer to it as features. And again, it is essentially a representation for each token of what the model has learned based on the text that is trained with. And so if we were looking at um, the output, we would see something, we would see a tensor that looked like batch size by sequence by hidden state. So if we had a batch size of four and we were using um, BERT, for example, that allows for a max 512 and the base checkpoint, which allows which basically produces a vector of, I think, 768 numbers, we would see something like four by 512 by 768. And so we'll look at, and we get to the CoLab also kind of how to uh, look at those things. So that's essentially what the, what the kind of the raw auto model does. And then what we do for different tasks, whether it's sequence classification, named entity recognition, uh, summarization, is that we switch the head and we'll kind of look at this we'll we'll show a way in collab how to actually look at the model and you can see that the head is replaced by something specific to the task and so it could be as simple as an in -in dot linear layer it could be a couple separated by um, some non-linearity but the head is custom and it's typically um, depending on the checkpoint typically these are randomized weights that during the training process um, you're going to learn. And then the last step in the pipeline is actually the post-processing of the outputs. So one of the things I, I really like about um, the transformers uh, architecture is that both the inputs and outputs are specialized objects. So if you're looking in Jupyter uh, Notebook or in Colab or VS Code, um, you could actually do inputs dot and get IntelliSense and see what's in there. And um, so amongst other things that it returns or you can ask it re to return are the raw logits. So again, those are just numbers that um, the model predicts. And we can tell like which one it's favoring, but if we want to convert these to actual probabilities, we can see the confidence the model's assigning to uh, the different labels in this uh, scenario. We run it through a uh, softmax. And then here we can see that this first one is showing, you know, um, uh, for uh, it's, you know, 96% label one, 99% uh, label zero here. And this is really, yeah, most neural networks, most loss functions fuse or combine the final activation with the um, loss. And so this is typically handled for you. And so if you look at like libraries like FastAI, you will actually see the results look something like this. You don't have to actually run them through uh, softmax. And so with that, we'll look at a demo, but before that, any questions? I think we're all still recovering from the bombing, but I, I'll just ask <laughs> a silly question. Um, how do you pick the transformer that you want to run? Assuming you're totally new to like this uh, ecosystem, how, how do you pick which model you want to start running? You know, for me, a lot of it is, um, I think if you go to like the, the hugging face, like the, their, their forums, you can ask questions and see what folks are using. For me, it's a little bit of trial and error and also just kind of reading other papers and seeing uh, the experiences other folks have had. So um, I'm not sure if there's like a great resource that says like, you know, for this specific task and this specific type of corpus, use this transformer. Um, but I think if you ask on the forums, you'll probably get 
you know, some feedback on the hugging face forums. I know for me, for like sequence classification, I've had really good experience using Roberta and Bart. And I'm usually working on English texts that are um, like, at least for my work, a lot of like survey type comments, things like that. Those have proven to, to work pretty well. And then of course you can actually use weights and biases and, and a frame and like a tuning framework like Optuna. And you can actually try different architectures and see what happens. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Lucas mentioned in the chat that he usually filters down hugging face .co slash models for the specific language and task. And that's, that's a good starting point as well. Yep. Yep. And what's nice there is that a lot of them actually have their metrics um, that they've got from their validation set. So, and again, this thing is find something that's uh, like using that approach. If you kind of know what your raw text looks like, you can go ahead. If you know you're working with English, you're working with Chinese, you can start there and uh, at least start with some good pre-trained models, you know, irrespective and of the architecture for sure. That's, that's very helpful, thanks. Cool. Okay, so we're gonna go and first look, and this is essentially from the, um, the course here. And so we're gonna, we're gonna look at just what I just talked about um, right there is like, so here's the, again, the pipeline for sentiment analysis. And remember by default, this one is classifying two labels. So if you have more labels, you would have to you know, pass that in here. And uh, also this is something from last week. If you wanna see the exact um, model that uh, the pipeline's using, you can actually print uh, use model dot name or path to get that. And of course you can actually pass in your own uh, pre-trained model name or path as well up here if you have something specific you want to use. So again, with the checkpoints is that we're going to use the same checkpoint for tokenization as we do for getting our model so that everything lines up. So I'm going to go ahead and use auto tokenizer. And then we'll take a look at the, uh, the inputs. So using this particular tokenizer to still burn we only get two things. We get the input IDs, which are again, the indices into the vocab. And there's also some special IDs that the tokenizer automatically puts in there that the architecture requires for training. So in Distillbert and in BERT, you'll see like this class token um, and you'll see like a, like a separator token, SCP. And that's token 101. And uh, this is token um, uh, 102. And then you can see that we also have these uh, zero indices right here for this one right here for this particular text. And so remember that when we feed our inputs into a model, we're typically feeding them in batches and that needs to be a square matrix. And so to make that happen, uh, we actually use a padding token so that we have that squared matrix. And then we use an attention mask. So you can see in the attention mask, we have some zeros here to say, when you get to the self-attention layers, don't pay attention to those padding tokens. So that's what that means there. And then when we run through the model, so we create the model from the same checkpoint. And what's funny is you'll always get this kind of message about uh, the weights of the model um, are essentially uh, need to be fine-tuned at least the classification head. And remember I was talking about how we take the core pre-trained model, we put a new head on it for our task, right? For, so for classification. So those parts aren't trained. That's all this message is saying. And if you scroll over, you'll see it's all referring to the classification parts of this neural network. And so don't be nervous when you see this message come up. And it's amazing because like, if you go to the forums, people are like, what is that? What's happening? What did I do wrong? What's going on? It's just the informational message to say, you need to train that final part of your neural network. And if we pass the inputs that we just created, as I mentioned, we can look at uh, the last hidden state for just the auto model. And you see we have batch size by uh, sequence size by hidden state. And um, again, one of the nice things about the uh, transformers library, like I love the inputs and outputs are actually objects. So you can actually hit dot and actually see like what other information they're sending back. 
And when you create these models, you can actually request it to send other information, um, which is uh, kind of cool. And it's that's model specific and something you would learn from the documentation. So now if we go use that checkpoint and let's actually create a auto model for sequence classification. And I wanted to show you that you can also just print model and you can see what the whole uh, like the whole architecture looks like. And so this is really cool when you're trying to figure out like, okay, how did it, you know, how did it change for sequence classification? You could just print the model and then go down to the very bottom. And you can see that it has this pre-classification layer classifier, and it also includes some dropout. But this is, this right here is basically the custom head right here that was added on. And remember, we saw that warning that said these are randomly initialized, so they need to be trained. So if you're curious to like how transformers work for a specific task, create that model. So last week, I think someone asked about BART and how it's used for a sequence classification. Create the auto model uh, for sequence classification using a BART checkpoint, and then just print the model and see kind of how it's doing that. So um, again, once we run uh, through the model, we're going to get an outputs object and we can look at the shape of the logits. So remember we had a batch size of two and we're outputting two labels, right? Positive or negative. And then we could also like look at the logits right there. And then as a final step, as I mentioned, in normal cases, like when you're using fast AI, this will already be done for you as part of calculating the loss. But since we're just looking at running through the raw model, we need to actually run the logits through a softmax to get the probabilities or confidence that the model is assigning to the different labels. And then um, also what's kind of cool, because we don't know what those labels are, if we actually do look at the configuration object and the ID to uh, label, that tells us that zero is negative, one is positive. Any questions on that yet, Sonia? Uh, this one question, how is the number of hidden states uh, determined? How are they determined? Yes. So they're determined by the particular architecture and, and they are, they can vary. So um, like for BERT, there's a BERT based architecture, which is 768. So that was the number they came up with. And then there is a BERT large architecture. And I, I don't know what it is. I want to say it's like 1,024. It's a little bit bigger. And so, um, so it's really just determined by the architecture and the, the particular checkpoint. If I may add, usually companies like Google that do these researches have, like a, have access to good amount of resources. So they also run these architectural searches where they just can go all out and compare different hidden states and see what works best. Usually those are sometimes mentioned in the paper. So that's also something that happens behind the scenes. Yeah, I was gonna say the papers are a good source to go to because they've, you know, typically the folks that uh, have introduced these architectures have also done, a, you know, a bunch of ablation type studies. And so they've played around with different lengths and different, you know, number of layers, uh, different lengths for everything. And so that's probably a really good recommendation is to look at the actual paper. Awesome. Uh, the second question is, what is the difference between using auto model and the architecture specific classes? Example, uh, BERT model, is there any upside to using just the latter? So just using BERT model, for example. The only upside is that if you decide to use a different checkpoint, so, you know, it may be a different model or the same uh, model architecture, but, you know, a different version is that you wouldn't have to recode everything to use a specific hugging face objects. So with the, with the auto tokenizer, auto model, auto config, you could just pack that checkpoint and it will infer and, and give you the same thing as if you were using the architecture specific um, objects. Another one, in, in case of auto model, is the head also pre-trained? On the auto model, no. So 
with the with the auto model, it works this, the same way as if you're using the regular objects. Is that that last um, the head, whatever it is for your task, is going to be randomly initialized. If you're using something like like this one right here is fine tuned for um, SS uh, is fine tuned for this particular for the SST two data set, and I think. I'm not a hundred percent sure. It, it actually this this one right here because it's fine tuned for this particular data set. It actually may start with a fine tuned classification head. If you were using something like the Stilbert base uncase, right, just by this, it would be randomly initialized. This I'm I'm not actually hundred percent sure. If anybody knows, stick it in the chat. But this might actually give you a um, a classification head that predicts two labels with. Um, learned weights, not 100%. Anything else? Uh, no, thanks, thanks. Okay. Cool. All right, so let's go ahead and look at um, just an example. So we'll look at the blur library and kind of see how it does those same steps. And again, next week we'll be looking at uh, three different integration libraries. This is just one of them. This is the one that I created. But we'll kind of go through the same behind the scenes steps so you can see you know, how it how it works. And essentially, when I designed uh, Blur, I have a very fast AI first focus. So if you go through the course, and you learn how to build your data block API, and build your data loaders, and your learner, and uh, you're comfortable with using methods like show batch and show results, and uh, uh, how fast AI does the exporting of learners for inference. I really tried to make it so that this would be very familiar uh, to folks coming from that uh, vantage point. So I'm just going to go ahead and do a quick pip install of fast AI and blur, do some imports of everything. And I'm going to use the same uh, checkpoint that we are using above. Um, also, if you look at the FastAI course, part of FastAI, they have this nifty uh, untar data function that you actually pass it a URL to a data set. It will download it, untar it, and then return the path so that you can, in a couple lines of code, actually have, for example, here, a data frame, frame with all your data. And so uh, this particular data set is pretty simple. We have a, a label negative or positive. We have the, the sequence, the text is associated with. And then we also have this column right here that we can use in our data blocks for um, building our separate training and validation uh, data loaders. And then so one thing, so we talked about above, like how do we get these hugging face objects and whatnot. So with Blur, I have a utility uh, object called Blur. And you could call get HF objects. It accepts a bunch of different quarks for the config, the tokenizer, the model. But usually you could pass a checkpoint, the particular auto model class that you want, and it will get all the right objects for you. And so here you can see, since we're using the same checkpoint as above, the architecture is to Stilbert. And you can see it properly inferred the correct uh, config object, tokenizer, and uh, model to use. And then from here, we'll go through this, some of these other parameters in a moment. These are the defaults, but when we get to tokenization, we'll we'll take a look at like how different values affect your um, uh, examples and the actual inputs. But again, following um, kind of like how the fast AI way of building your data is we have an object in Blur called HF text block that takes your hugging face objects and you could pass, there's a whole bunch of other parameters you can pass for tokenization, configuration, and the model. Um, and this will actually give you a data block that understands how to work with the to, with our with our raw data that we have in the data frame. And since we're doing a classification task, we use the category block 
So that's what you use for multi-class classification in fast AI. And you can see with this, with the data frame and just a couple line of code, we can actually build a data block and we're using the call splitter to split our uh, training and validation. And as I mentioned before, we have this column which says whether this should be part of the training or validation set and the call splitter by default uses that value. And so anything that has is valid is true is gonna be part of the validation uh, data set. Anything where it's false is gonna be part of the training data set. And so with that, we have our data block. And again, uh, if you're confused about anything with the data block, take a look at the FastBook uh, information. It's got a bunch of stuff in there. Zach's walk uh, with FastAI has got a lot of good information about how this works and how you can, um, and like a bunch of different options for building your data block. But at the end of the day, the data block is a blueprint for how to take your raw data and turn it into data loaders that you can then use in a model. So with this information, we can actually on the data block called data loaders, pass our data, which is a data frame. You can pass a bunch of other options, but I'm just gonna include a batch size of four. And that's going to actually create our data loaders. And then once you have your data loaders, they function very similar to how you use the data loaders in FastAI for any other task. So you have show batch, and you have you know a bunch of different options you could pass in there for the you know you can truncate the text, um, control how many examples you want to see, and then we can also look under the covers and see well okay this is nice this is what it looks like but what does it look like to the model right, and so in FastAI the data loaders objects has a nifty function called one batch, and what that's going to do is just return a single batch of your um, training data. And so again, there are your inputs and your targets, right? And so we can go ahead and say, okay, we want the inputs put in this XB variable, y, YB to reference our targets, and we can look at our XB. So here we're looking at our inputs and you can see we specified a batch size of four and we see four attention, uh, uh, mass entries in this attention mass tensor, and we see four um, items in this uh, input IDs tensor, and that refers to you know whatever batch. I don't know if this is random or it's just like or whatever. I think it's just a random batch it grabs. So every time you run this, I think this is going to you know, looks like it's giving the same results. So maybe I'm wrong. Um, but um, anyway, so that's how you can actually look at your your inputs. And you'll notice that one of the things that's different with Blur is that I try to respect the hugging face, the idea that they have an inputs object and an outputs object. And so uh, FastAI isn't designed natively to handle objects like this, right? That look like a dictionary. And so we can explore it in later sessions, but if you start looking at the documentation, you can see kind of how I compensate for that. Essentially, I, I use the the, uh, the hugging face input and outputs, but use callbacks in FastAI to translate them accordingly so that they work in FastAI, because out of the box, um, you can't send the dictionary like this through a model using FastAI. And then we'll look at other ways, because I think uh, uh, FastHugs does things maybe a little bit differently. I think Zach does something a little bit differently in Adapt NLP. So we'll explore those, those options. and hear from the other authors as to what are the, the design guidelines that were um, driving those decisions. So once we have this, we can actually um, look at the batch information. And this is always a good practice, regardless of whether you're using um, Hugging Face or some other model is to really understand what your batches look like. This will save you a lot of time when you start troubleshooting and start getting information about uh, shapes not being right or whatnot. And so we can see that here with Blur, we have a batch that has, there's two things in, uh, uh, in the inputs. In, and one of those is the input IDs. And that's got a shape of four by 512. And then we also have the attention mask, which is the same shape, right? And there's gonna be ones associated to numbers that 
this, the attention layer should pay attention to and zero for once uh, where it shouldn't. Um, we can also see that we have four here, or uh, we have four items in the input IDs, which is what we expect. And then we can see for our targets, we also have four items. So this is just helpful for debugging and making sure things look right before you start uh, training. So once we have that, um, before we look at like fine tuning next week, we can actually just, just like we did in the example above is we can actually run those inputs right here uh, through our hugging face model. And just like we did above, we can look at the shape of the logits, we can look at the actual logits, and we can go through the process of getting uh, probabilities and then actually looking at the labels. So we can use a lot of the same uh, code that we saw just from the raw hugging face library in conjunction with blur or any of the other libraries that we're going to be looking at next week. Any uh, questions from all that information? I don't see any, but I'll just say it like blur. I'm, I'm curious to check out adapt NLP as well, but it really feels like at least for blur, it's very fast AIE. So it doesn't yeah. like feel it's a different library at all. Cool. Yeah. That's kind of, yeah, that's kind of like my, my goal is that if you've, if you've gone through the first course of fast AI, you should look at blur and be like, oh yeah, I understand how everything works. And then you could get into the docs and I try to make, make it as clear as possible. And if it's not, and there's documentation missing, I love PR. So, uh, you know, if anybody wants to help on documentation or testing or improving it, submit them. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my goal is that if you've gone through the first course, even just the first few sessions, it should be pretty straightforward how to, how to work with the library, I hope. So um, the next slide we'll look at is, uh, so now that we kind of have what's going on in the pipeline, right? We know how to actually code that um, just using pure hugging face. We've seen an example of how to you know, code that with blur is, um, uh, you know, we have the idea of models and just like someone asked previously is why do we use auto model versus just the, the specific uh, model we want to use? It's really just to make it simple if we want to play with different models. So it just reduces your code, makes things simpler to understand, um, uh, simpler to run tests and experiments with. And with the auto model, probably the most important uh, method is from pre-trained. And again, this is where we pass our checkpoint. Or if we're using a pre-trained model that we've created, we would pass like the path to the folder our, uh, our uh, trained artifacts are in. And we'll look at that in just a second. Um, but basically is, so from pre-trained, um, the model's now initialized with weights um, with, all, with all the weights of that checkpoint and it can be used directly for inference on the task it was trained on. And it can also be fine tuned on a new task. Um, so remember, like we looked at that SST2 model and based on this, actually, I think that the classification head does have um, learned weights, not 100% sure, but you could actually take that model and say, hey, I don't wanna, I wanna use that same checkpoint but I, I have uh, 30 classes and you could pass in, um, you know, number of labels equals 30 and it would alter that classification head. And then in that case, absolutely, I know that those weights are gonna be random because it wasn't trained on that task. So, uh, so free, for, from pre-trained is probably the, um, uh, the method you're going to be using uh, most and, and learn most about as you start using transformers. Uh, we also have a save pre-trained. So if you want to save your pre-trained model and, or not your pre-trained, but your trained model and that you've initialized from a pre-trained checkpoint and tokenizer, you're going to use the save uh, pre-trained method. And essentially what this is gonna do is create a couple files. One is a config.json. And th this is essentially all the attributes that are necessary to reconstruct the architecture and what you trained it for. So in this case, if I actually did take that distilled BERT model and I trained it on uh, a task with 30 labels, 
you would see like the number of labels would be set to 30 in here. So folks would, would know whether they could just use it as is or would have to uh, change that up. And then we also have the .bin file, and this is simply a state dictionary. It contains all your uh, models and weights. And so I'm gonna go back to the CoLab here. And let's see. So before we get to the save and pre-trained, just as a little uh, preview of what you'll see next week, I'm not gonna do fine tuning right now, but I'm actually going to create a learner using the blur library uh, for the checkpoint that we have above and the data loaders. And you can see like, once I have that learner, that is like freeze, unfreeze. So things that you are already familiar with in fast AI work, we can actually look at the results. So I'm not training it. We're just looking at the results right now. And you'll see that the results are already probably gonna be really good. Um, most of the models that are in Hugging Face have been trained. And if you're looking at models that are trained on the same task that you're looking at, they're already gonna probably be pretty good. So we can look at the results. And as I mentioned, I have a bunch of different kind of helper functions like blur predict that can take one or more uh, pieces of text and we'll tell you the label, the label index, as well as give you those probabilities right there just with one line of code. But what I wanted to show you is with models is we talked about that save pre-trained. And so I can also go here and I'm just gonna create a my model directory. And then I am going to save uh, the, so after, after actually learning and training, this is going to have some modified weights to it, right? And I'm going to save the model and the tokenizer that I'm using into that directory there, right? And this is everything. So when we look later on at actually pushing our models to the hub, so we have that hub, right? The Hugging Face model hub, which has just, you know, all kinds of models. You can actually use a library like Blur and probably adapt or fast tugs to uh, train a model, save those artifacts and push them to the hub and make that available to others. And you can see like I'm actually with uh, Blur, I have the hugging face model as part of the model that's passed in or associated to the learner. But we can see if I look at the model versus the this one, it's it's the same object. So this is the object that's getting modified. The weights are getting changed. And I'm gonna look at that directory. So you can see that some of the um, artifacts we talked about with uh, the uh, model uh, save pre-trainer in there as well as some of the to tokenizer, like the vocab and its, its uh, configuration as well. And just to prove that we can now use this. So imagine this is trained and we wanna use it. Notice that instead of passing a name from the hub, I'm just gonna actually pass this, um, this path to the my model directory. And when we look at it, we can see it's distilled bird. It's using the distilled bird config, the right tokenizer, and it's using the correct model architecture for sequence classification. So that's just a little like to show you that you can use, um, you know, blur, or you can just, you know, after it's done its training and actually just access those objects you created um, up here, oops, right here, you can actually use those objects then to um, uh, save all the, the necessary things to be able to use it in the future or to push it to the hub. And I think that is it from this part here. Any uh, questions? come up Sanya nope nothing so far I just wanted to point out that when we were starting this everyone was like assuming they might need resources to access to resources but like things work really well inside of collab as well oh yeah yeah sometimes you gotta like tweak things a little bit um but uh hopefully at least I think I noticed that the collab from the course doesn't always work and you have to uh, change things but you should be able to you know, muck with it enough to be able to, to get it to work. 
So anyway, so with that, um, the next part of the course goes through tokenizers. And we've already talked about that the job of the tokenizer is to take raw text and convert it to numbers. And there's a variety of algorithms. And um, if you go through the course, uh, they kind of have like a little video segment on each of them and pros and cons. So like base, like probably the most basic would be like a word-based tokenizer that splits on spaces. But this is typically not desirable because it creates large vocabularies, which makes it harder to um, uh, train your models. You lose meaning across related words. So like if you had the word dog and dogs, those would have two separate, uh, those would be two separate tokens. So they would have two separate IDs, which means that the embedding learned for each one would be different, even though they are very semantically similar. And these also um, produce a lot of unk or unknown tokens um, because they're not in the vocabulary. And uh, the problem with that is that if a token is unknown, you're really not gonna learn anything about it. So it's not going to um, help you in whatever your task is. The uh, other one are character-based tokens. And these are not desirable typically because you don't really get meaningful embeddings. The vocab is smaller, right? So, you know what I mean? It might, instead of being 50,000 or 60,000 tokens, it might be 30, 40, or 50. Um, but you really lose a lot of the semantic meaning of words because you're breaking them down into individual characters. And also when you actually pass these through your model, it's gonna take more tokens to represent the sequence. So that could be taxing on your, on your compute resources. And it may mean that you have to add more truncation so you lose more information just to get your models um, to work. So what's the solution? It's subword tokenizers. And with subword tokenizers, the fundamental goal is common words should not be split up and rare words should be split up as needed. And the benefits is that you get semantic meaning. So like here you'll see like let's, even though this might get split up by a word-based tokenizer because of the, uh, uh, the punctuation, it actually keeps this word together because let apostrophe s is common. Same with do, um, but you can see with tokenization, it actually pulls out token from ization. And so anything that has token in it, you're going, regardless of, of whether or not there is some, something at the end, it's going to be able to use that meaning in your sequences. And then you can see we also have the uh, punctuation that was pulled out into its own token. So the, the core benefits is that you get, uh, you maintain a lot of semantic meaning between your tokens. You have a small vocab and it works well with uh, many different languages. And very rarely, if ever, will you see an unknown token. So as an example, like my name is a weird spelling of Wade, it's W-A-Y-D-E. And I can guarantee if we were looking at a word-based tokenizer, that'd be a punk. It'd be nothing to learn from that. But using uh, subword tokenizers, it would be parsed out to way, W-A-Y, and then D-E with you know, something like this or D-E with this particular um, notation or if you're using bird, it would be like you know, two hashtags and D-E. So um, it would be able to learn something about um, my name, which is what we want. And there's a whole bunch of subword tokenization strategies. And instead of trying to go through all of them, I've listed this link uh, right here in the transformers docs and different architectures use different strategies. And you can learn a little bit about those by going there. I don't know what the negatives are. I'm not an expert on these different strategies or, or what the negatives to subword tokenizers are. Um, so if folks wanna chime in uh, in the chat or discord, that'd be great. But this is this is a spot to learn more about those tokenization strategies. And then again, we've already kind of uh, gone through this: is that the way the tokenizer works? It takes your raw text, converts it to tokens, adds special tokens, right? And uh, you can see that it's got some of the. These are you know, of course the the uh, these are tokens, even though they're subwords, 
and then those are converted to our uh, indexes and our vocabulary. And just as a reminder that when you're using um, a checkpoint, you want to use the same checkpoint for the tokenizer as you do for the model to make sure everything lines up. If you don't, you're essentially training from scratch. And so make sure you have a lot of compute, a lot of coffee, and a lot of free time because um, it's going to take a while. Um, any questions come up yet, Sanyam, on anything? Um, yes, let me scroll, scroll up. Uh, so is the main focus of Blur on sequence classification or do you support other tasks as well? So Blur supports sequence classification, token classification like named entity recognition, uh, extractive Q&A, uh, summarization and translation out of the box. And I have a low level API and also a high level API. Uh, for all those tasks and also language modeling. So causal, model, uh, causal language modeling is implemented and then mass language model has an initial implementation, but the only strategy that I'm using for mass language mo modeling is the bird strategy from their paper. And so I'm hoping people can see how that works and add other strategies in there because there's a variety of different ways to do the masking. Um, so yeah, language modeling is in there too. And uh, the best resource would be just the docs, right? To check these out. Absolutely, yeah. And just, uh, this is me thinking out loud. So for the subword tokenization, I'm assuming it might take longer for the model to converge because uh, we're like splitting up the meanings or we might need more memory because like we might have more tokens now. I, I know I need to experiment this, but I'm just, I think thinking. Yeah, so, yeah so I mean, that I think going back to this link right here, there's like a lot of good resources. Plus there's links to the different papers that discuss the different tokenization strategies. So, you know, folks, we've heard about like, like sentence piece, word piece, byte pair encoding. Those are our all subword tokenization strategies. And um, people a lot smarter than me, obviously have put papers and done a bunch of studies as to why, why they've introduced and, and why, theirs may be better than other ones for certain cases. Um, but definitely, like you're saying, things like the length of vocab um, matters. Um, how, like what they consider rare words is going to have an impact, you know, on uh, the embeddings that you get. So um, yeah, so there's a lot, a lot of information you can get there, or you can be lazy like me and go, hey, Roberta works good, I'm using Roberta. Awesome, thanks. So um, the last part of this course talks about handling uh, multiple sequences. And so the big things here is to remember that when you're um, uh, sending inputs through a model, we're seeing them in mini batches. And so a mini batch needs to be a square matrix, even if the token number of tokens varies in each of your examples. And then we also need to be able to use, um, uh, to tell the models where to apply attention. So hopefully you all read the attention is all, uh, all you need paper uh, last week. If not, read it this week. And you can see that we really want these attention layers, which play a significant role in the transformers architecture to just pay attention to things that matter, which means essentially ignore padding tokens. And so in transformers, uh, again, so there's three things that we really have to um, or two things that we have to specify ahead of time in addition to understanding attention. And the first is padding. So we need to make sure that for every batch, the sequence size is the same. And there's a bunch of different options. Um, so the first one we have here is padding equals true or longest. And that means it's going to pad the sequences up to the maximum sentence length in the batch. And this is typically what you want because um, it allows for uh, more efficient models and the performance, it's going to be, your models are going to be faster. So if the sequence size allows for 512, right? Like for BERT or distilled BERT, and we say max length, then there's going to be padding so that every single sequence is 512 characters, right? So you're going to have like a four by 512 matrix. But imagine that in your batch, uh, the longest sequence is 100 characters. Well, by using padding equals true or longest, you would have four by 100, 
So again, it's going to make your models faster. Um, whoops. And then lastly, you can actually specify max length and a actual max length. And this is actually typically, um, so I usually use the, the, the padding strategy, but if you find out like you're going through your um, uh, text and you want to do like experimentation and you want to be fast, you can actually use this strategy right here and specify a very small max length so you can quickly iterate through your experiments initially. And then we have truncation and basically truncation is used to make sure that the sequences you run through your model um, will fit for the given architecture you're using um, and also for your GPU. So if you want to, again, truncate to, you know, like the sequence like the like eight would probably be too small, but maybe 128, even though the model takes 512, um, this can actually um, make things a little bit um, easier on your GPU, make your experimentation uh, faster. And you may actually want to kind of pre-tokenize your raw text to see you know, how, what is the biggest, what's the mean, and figure out a max length somewhere in between there where you're getting good performance, but also not having to uh, waste a lot of time watching your models train. And then, of course, we talked about the attention mask already. And essentially, this is just telling attention layers what to pay attention to, what not to pay attention to. And the tokenizer will build these things uh, for you. And so, as I said, if we go back to um, Blur right here, and let's go to this step right here. So we can actually, in Blur, we can actually pass that information, the max length padding and truncation uh, into this HF text block, amongst a bunch of other things. And so if I wanted to, let's say I wanted to um, change the max length so that, you know, it was 128, regardless of how big the sequences were. And then I ran through this part, you can see they're smaller. And if I go to look at the shape of things, you can see that even though the actual text might be 512 or greater, it's not using that to define the length. It's using the 128 I specified here. And so all these different strategies um, that we've just kind of gone over can actually be passed into the text, uh, the HF uh, text block, and you'll get the behavior uh, that you expect. Any uh, questions on any of that? Nope, all no, no questions so far. All right. And uh, again, there's a, a link that will be included in the slides, which is essentially in the Hugging Face documentation. Like what we've discussed here in terms of padding, truncation, and max length um, uh, is not exhaustive. There's other options that you may want to explore. But typically, in most of the stuff that you're probably working on, you want to have padding equals true truncation equals true and max length equal to none or like a specific max length like 128 um, uh, in order to get things to run on your GPU or because you have a small data set and you know what I mean, whatever. Um, but if you uh, want to look at all those different uh, options uh, when you're actually building your models, um, you'll be able to have this link and you'll know more than you ever wanted to about padding and truncation maybe even have nightmares about it because there's a lot of things you can do. Um, so with that, any final questions or is everything absolutely clear today, even after our Zoom bombs? It was crystal clear to me. I'm sure All if right. I was able to understand everyone else was. All right, good, good. So for um, homework is watch the official course videos. There's a lot of really, um, good content in the videos. It's not uh, in the uh, doc, you know, in the actual course documentation when you go through each section. And uh, just like we have one blog post, which I'll retweet from Ravi, I think. Um, blog, something you've learned from week one or two, 
and um, see if you can actually include some actual code in your blog that using Peer Hugging Face or one of the FastAI libraries. Uh, that's a great way to learn and also help others who are starting behind you. And then if you haven't, or even if you have, take another read at the attention is all you need paper and also the Jay Alomar uh, 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 blog as well. And pick an architecture you're curious about. So one of the questions is, you know, how do you, how do you actually choose an architecture for what you're trying to do? Um, find one that you're interested in that you've heard about and people have been hyping. Um, like for example, like I have really good sex, uh, uh, good success with uh, Roberta or Bart. Maybe pick one of those, read the paper. And um, as you go through, if you have uh, questions, use the Discord and let's talk about it. But that's a great way to kind of learn like um, not only how they work, but whether or not it's something that's suitable for what you're doing. And then lastly, uh, sorry about the typo. It's not get read, it's get ready for some competitions. So we're going to have some friendly competitions that we'll announce uh, next week that will hopefully be fun and uh, help uh, uh, improve all of our learning of these things by actually doing some stuff. So we'll announce that next week. And that's it. We've made it through Zoom bombing. We've made it through section two. Any final questions? <laughs>